I'll put you on mute, David, for now. But cool. All right, let's get started. So, hello, everybody. Welcome to Semantic Kernel Public Community Office Hours. I always need to say public because it's a public forum. So, for everyone on the call, just be wary and aware of that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we have uh, not as many questions today, uh, at least that were submitted. Um, but we actually have a lot of announcements and even things that literally just came uh, on within the last couple minutes. So happy to share all that with you. Um, as always, right, uh, if you want to engage in conversation, you know, raise your hand uh, or you know, put things in the chat, uh, we are happy to, to you know, go through those type of questions or topics or things that you want to cover. It's a open forum, right? We have some agenda, but it's really uh, it's for you all. So let's make this time useful, useful to you. All right. So to get started, so some announcements. We have some new blog posts. Uh, we have uh, actually a very this literally just came in like maybe an hour ago. Uh, an update to telemetry on. Um, how to track your token usage and costs with Semantic Kernel. So this is a very, very much uh, requested and talked about uh, topic. Uh, and yeah, as you all are developing these applications, uh, AI applications, right? You want to make sure you're not running the running the bill, uh, uh, at least not beyond what you intend. So definitely read that post. Um, we also have some new. Uh, improvements to Chat Copilot, our reference sample for uh, building chatbots. Uh, so definitely look at that. And we also have this guest post from my colleague uh, Gopi Gopi Kumar um, in the office of the CTO. He wrote a uh, kind of like journal reflection piece on his uh, experience transitioning or just using LangChain first, and then um, and then. Uh, going to Semantic Kernel. And actually, it's relevant to the later announcement I'll share, but he basically took the deep learning.ai course from uh, Andrew Ng uh, that was with Langchain and translated that to Semantic Kernel. So definitely read that post to, to see. I think a lot of people uh, have asked a lot, even in this forum, about Langchain versus SK. And at least this is not to show off you know, one is better than the other. It's more so saying, OK, as a journey, as a developer journey, you know, how can you make that decision for yourself? All right, uh, some late the latest news. I shall make this slightly bigger. OK, so we have some new stuff. Actually, Python has had a lot of things come in since the last time I shared this. So in both 0.3.9 and 0.3.10, uh, a lot of uh, new features have come in. Things like integrating with the Google Palm uh, model, uh, as well as Stepwise Planner. Stepwise Planner got uh, got merged into to Python uh, as well, so you can play around with that. I'll actually one of my tasks is to update the the notebook to at least um, feature Stepwise Planner. And ah, like a quality of life thing is that uh, if it's not present in all the notebooks, it will be. But we want to. You know, as OpenAI at least is transitioning away from text completion and in favor of chat completion models, we want to just make sure that chat completion is like the default that you see in the notebooks. Because a lot of people will still ask the the question like, "Oh, hey, my model, my my skill or plugin doesn't work because I'm using a uh, you know a I'm using GPT three five Turbo with the text completion API." Just quality of life things, and yes, you all can read the release notes for for that. Uh, Java's for now still remain the same, and .NET has had some new things come in as well, uh, especially even around looks like telemetry and uh, plan updates. So depending on which flavor of the semantic kernel you're interested in, uh, keep up to date on the latest releases. So one thing that Again, a lot of people, in, even in this call, have asked about is function calling. 
right? Supporting OpenAI functions. I know it's been a long time coming, uh, so thank you all for your patience. But we should very soon have this in Python at least, and .NET to soon follow. Um, so if you are interested, just check out this uh, PR. Um, you can go ahead and play around with it, or wait for the latest uh, or the next uh, PIP package to to be released. Uh, in terms of some new video content, right? You can see this on YouTube, where uh, my colleague Matthew Bolognos, uh he uh, shows off in a more in-depth way um, how to create your first ChatGPT-style plugin with Semantic Kernel. And you know, it was a talk given to hackathon participants, but you know, it's sure relevant uh, information for for you all as well. And the biggest announcement, because it literally just came in, is so I mentioned deep learning AI, Andrew Ng. Uh, so John Meta, um, VP of AI and Design here, at Microsoft. Um, he collaborated with Andrew uh, to create the Semantic Kernel plus deep learning AI course. So I think that the title is How Business Thinkers Can Start Building AI Plugins with Semantic Kernel. So. It's literally out today, uh, so definitely check that out. Take the course, get that certification, um, so put it on your LinkedIn um, and share it. You know, we'd love to to get your feedback um, on this. So definitely very exciting, and more to come. Uh, in terms of a link, I will find that after I kick it off. To I'll work. I'll work on it for you, Andrew. Uh, oh, yes. Open, yeah. Oh, yes, please. People in the chat, go ahead. Uh, so actually, so before we go into the questions that we have, and again, please paste any that you want to talk through in the chat. Um, David, David Pierce has some topics that he'd like to to share, which uh, super relevant for uh, securing your AI applications. So David, I will hand it to you. Cool. Uh, Thanks, Alex. Uh, I'll also keep it short, Doug. I know you actually signed up on the GitHub, and so I feel super guilty. Um, but this is two twofold here, right? I want to introduce something that I think is important enough to mention, uh, and then kind of explain how I and like uh, other folks I've seen are, are solving the problem, and then kind of put it back to the community of uh, is somebody else got a way to do this that I haven't, and, and go from there. But uh, let me share my screen and we'll ask questions. Uh, window. Here we go. Uh, so I'll start with this, and when you guys can see my screen, let me know. Um, yeah, cool. Now you should see kind of a spooky-looking uh, paper uh, slash website from some smart folks at Carnegie Mellon, right? Um, ultimately, like what's happening here uh, is they've taken uh, the shared universal like dependencies of most language models, meaning like common crawl, transformers architecture, etc., and uh, found ways to, you know, say, uh, all right, I, I can't steal some of the identity, but if I add a control string, which you'll note looks remarkably like parameterized URL, right? Um, it's easy to do. Uh, if you hadn't seen this, I'm sorry for the bummer. This is not just prompt injection. This is actual like attack strings. Uh, and to make it worse before it gets better, right? Um, here is like a link that I'll pop in the chat to the actual like class for how you parameterize and build these. I'll, I'll share it in a second, um, but ultimately, it, it is it is trivial now, is what I'm saying, uh, to generate uh, attack strings that you can reuse. Um, and because there is an n number of these things, it's not like you can just code business rules to to solve for like a given prefix. Um, right now, it's downloading. I'm rerunning this collab notebook again, so here in a second, I should be able to to, to pull some more for you. Um, but part of why I've got a collab notebook is because I wanted to to be easy for people to run these experiments themselves, right? Um, get a sense for what these attack strings look like. Um, because what I'm hoping to do, right? Other than having kind of a weird 80s themed website, right? Uh, where I'm trying to be loud, but in a funny way about a very real problem, uh, namely how do you monitor like n-dimensional drift, like in a vector space, right? Uh, especially when these things are universally vulnerable. Um, what I've done and what I've found, right, is that using kind of default architectures of an abstracted runtime and through some pretty normal, you know, data engineering of input preprocessing, enrichment monitoring and clustering, 
output post processing and, and forecasting, right? Um, we get to a place where, you know, I've got a couple Lambda functions, I've got a DynamoDB instance uh, and another Lambda. Not that this is technology specific, right? But that with some very simple wrapping, um, we were able to have me sleep again at night. Is it the joke, right? That uh, suddenly these things are easier to monitor, easier to not have to worry about because you know that what's going to the customer is something that you've vetted and validated. Uh, and, and I'll pause there because the next step for me is going to be, you know, using these generated strings to try to train a model that's able to differentiate between a, a parameterized URL and an attack string. But that ultimately, if you guys have not already been thinking while you're using semantic kernel about how you integrate this into your application stack, how you uh, sanitize your inputs, how you monitor your outputs, right? Um, and then you're going to have a bad time. Uh, and not just because the runtime is vulnerable, but because you should be using conformal prediction instead of like Bayesian statistics, right? To to forecast your outputs. Uh, and so uh, I'll pause because the question is really one of the community. Have other people been worried about this? Am I alone? Uh, and then secondly, how are you guys solving for it? So uh, thanks, Alex. Go ahead, Doug. Oh, you're, you're muted. Our audio is not coming through. It was muted. I got two double mute buttons. Uh, right. So uh, I don't have a solution for this, but I saw this article when it came out and my initial reaction was the pre-processing, you know, just like detecting intent um, in in that sort of skill, the garbage English, the, the examples all depended on seem like a really just two, two rules that I've considered putting into our product. One is I'm sorry, that isn't language I understand just because it's garbage and I can detect it with a regex. And then if I'm doing a gather step, um, if my query against my embeddings returns nothing with high confidence, you know, below a threshold, then I also bail um, to some sort of generic, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're talking about kind of output and never send it to the LLM in the first place. You're, you're also on mute, David. Cool. Well, it, now we get to be there together. So thank you, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm using conformal prediction uh, just because I, I used to be like a Bayesian guy. Uh, and there was a pun that I used to have, but I, I don't care enough about the pun right now. Um, I, we've done the same, not using regex, right? But we're, we're, we're basically appending like a, a prediction interval rather than a confidence interval. And that anything that deviates by like a set value from the expected like uh, vector space where, you know, uh, our outputs have traditionally been right. It starts talking about, you know, underwriting instead of policy administration, then we shut that down, right? Um, because we both want to make sure the models generalize well, and because we want to make sure they're not being attacked. And that's where the stuff from like uh, latentspace.tools, right, which is just my weird version of my own GitHub, uh, explains like those five-step processes. Because we, we, I say, we uh, maybe it's only me and a couple other paranoid guys, right? Uh, but we took it a step further with output uh, post-processing, right? Um, and the the weird Jimmy Neutron thing will also do like uh, enrichment of your data, uh, uh, vectorization, and like identify new clusters or new values so that you actually have like a real-time hook. You're not just kind of banking your money on your pre-processing, but you actually have like real-time monitoring of, of what's going on. Um, sure. I so, mean, I think that thank you, having Doug. the model be yeah. able to deal with it is like far more robust than what I was talking about. But my, you know, my thought was, you know, in an application, I wouldn't actually have this output, but it would be like, LOL is your cat on your keyboard, right? Because that's what. Oh, I got you. Like, like it, additional to my like lambdas, you're saying like building it into your application, building the same principles into your application. Yeah, right? exactly. Just to just some basic detectors for garbage input and rejection of them carte blanche um, seems yeah. like a perfectly fine response from a system if i get a, a wad of non-english characters followed by you yes. know so long as you don't garbage, right? URL, right? right yeah well like sql injection attacks and other things that I, I don't know do you think not to like derail the conversation but it, it seems to me that people are going to be coming up with these novel scenarios for years as they come up with individual techniques for jailbreaking it. And so nipping it in the bud on the front end is maybe an easier generic approach in the meantime. Agree on principle, except that there's not enough like determinism in how these mm -hmm. things are generated. 
that you can really do regex. And I love that having used regex in our first deep learning thing, right? Along with uh, an RNN that kind of highlighted the text we thought was important, right? Like five years ago. Um, the, the issue is that uh, uh, because these things are templatable and like easy to generate specifically, yeah, uh, it's easy to get past the regex. And that's why uh, I'm, I'm interested in, like just wish me luck, I guess is what I'm saying. And uh, I, I wanna train a model that differentiates because then you can have a confidence that this is actually a link to YouTube that I want it to transcribe versus, you know, something that's trying to harm the system. But uh, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not the only person thinking about this and glad that you're already kind of building this logic into your app. So thanks, dude. Yeah, that's thank good. you for working on it. That's really cool. How about from the rest of the, the people on the call? Anyone else have any tips and tricks for securing their AI apps? Feel free to just leave it in the chat. Uh, Little Bobby on. tables all day, right? But extra <laughs> stuff too. So, no. Cool. No, I, it, it's a good discussion. I was just recently watching a talk on kind of like security co-pilots and how what people are thinking about. And you know, one example that was shared was it's not even uh, LLM specific, but it just gave a product example of like Twitter. They you know, people are have found creative ways to bypass their spam filter, and it's literally by you know, if people want to like upload a post or like massively retweet something, they will just add like some special characters just at the end of it. And, you know, by doing so, like it could literally still be the same text, but just with the addition of these special characters at the end, it's able to bypass the, those spam filters. So, yeah, like the model, the text, that idiosyncrasy as if it's like novel stuff that it should wait. Um, yeah, that's. I love regex, but it's it's gonna get weird before it gets like normal again. So cool. Cool. Well, good discussion. Thanks, and yeah, definitely. I mean, keep us posted in terms of what you find, what you're you know using for your for your own tooling, um, best practices. And yeah, we will all get better at securing AI uh, together. So, so David, is the end result going to look like a classification algorithm, like a spam filter? I just, or, or is it baked into the model? Okay, yeah. Based, at least for now, the only way I can think of on like the the things that you can parameterize, right? And forgive me that I didn't put that link directly to like the template, right? Um, but this is the like the actual class, right? That you can have a goal, a target, like a tokenizer, like you you can you can try to key in on specific idiosyncrasies. So I'm thinking like a, like an ensemble of models that kind of looks at it and says, oh, I know what that is, right? So uh, that's the goal. I just got to generate enough like strings and then generate enough like parameterized URLs that are representative of like the top 10 websites or whatever. Um, but I'm gonna try to do like direct reference optimization too, so that like you build in like a reward function. So uh, Doug, I'll, I'll hit you up as I get more on that. And then once I have something that works, I'll come back. Otherwise I'll leave Alex alone until then, so. I also want to double or thumbs up Doug's comment that as these models get better, you can also rely on them to do more of this type of classification work. And you could have a scenario where you have many models kind of all checking, validating, securing your, your AI. I agree in principle. I've actually got like, I don't have it handy, like kind of a, like a, a rank ordered list of how you deal with hallucinations and the same is true. The reason I would suggest like an RNN rather than uh, an RNN or like a, like a, like a naive classifier, right? Um, is that an RNN has like de facto attention, right? For lack of a better word, like it has like semantic awareness, but it is not like all predicated on transformers and common crawl, meaning that you can uh, get your classification going without like introducing a log 4 j vulnerability for lack of a better word, you know? So uh, sure. thanks dude. So. No, that's good. That's good. Okay, so one thing actually, I see Doug post in this chat uh, a discussion, but you know, for to save people time reading this, Doug, do you want to maybe give the high level of what you are seeing or what you want? Sure. Um, 
I, I encountered this uh, about a month ago, probably uh, when the whenever it was the Uba Booga extension came out. Um, I had an uh, uh, I've got a NuGet package for uh, Uba Booga API helper, so I was like, oh, I'll see how they're similar and how they're different. And uh, what I noticed right off the bat was that the Uba Booga extension for Semantic Kernel is written doesn't work, and it doesn't work because of the complete request settings, which is in the core abstractions assembly, is a description of the OpenAI API. And that's where it ends off. So there's no mechanism to pass, um, you know, the rest of the uh, logic warpers and other parameters that the model I was using was expecting. And so I had to crack it open and recompile it. Um, is, um, I don't really know what the, answer to the question is from a design standpoint because my solution was to change it to a dictionary so that i could and and then initialize and i also bore, drilled a hole in the constructor of my connectors so that i could initialize those from the beginning and what's different i guess between uba and hugging face and i, I wrote another one uh, for cobol tcp that i'm using or cpp is that those are all shims that can load a whole bunch of different arbitrary models with their own personalities and quirks and right now so one problem is the complete request settings and the other one is the um and i don't know if this one's a problem or not but my, my gut said the way the the current prompt templating abstraction works which is aligned to the service provider and not the model i think um is also an issue but this sort of core issue defeats the whole plugin vision of semantic kernel for other backends if unless i was doing something very wrong but i don't think i was um so the, that's the problem is there's an insufficiently abstract member of the core namespace that the connector model relies on that only works well for one uh, specific provider which is open ai or azure open api open ai Everyone and I, I, I can't do a fix to this without breaking all the abstractions. And so I wrote a message before I did anything. Oh, no, you're good. It's, it's hilarious to me. Like, this is like literally the thing that brought me here. Like, I made like a reverse proxy, right? Um, just because that was the hackiest way I could like make it work um, when I was like playing with other models, uh, also primarily through Ubuga. So uh, no idea on fixing your thing. Uh, I did a hacky way, uh, but it, I don't know, man. Uh, I appreciate you figuring out a good way to like better abstract like both the well what these models expect and like uh and and how we call them so please do well it occurred to me all these have open ai specs right so some actual interrogation of the schema and evaluation of the inputs against it at runtime would be the robust way to do it um, what i did wasn't robust but you know. No, but like, there's also no consistency, right? Like, I'm all for like graceful schema evolution or whatever, but like the 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 line completion like format for like code llama or whatever is entirely arbitrary. And then right. if I'm trying to do like instruction fine tuning also, then like oh, you know, then I screw that up too. So uh, interesting problem that I just moved away from. So, <laughs> as, as I was writing that that comment, I thought, you know, this mostly seems like a complaint because it mostly is. I'd rather, you know, go here's like a really robust. But if it was me and this was my project, what I would do in the interim is change that to a dictionary string string on the request um, API and knock it and so, Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's good. I mean, I. I think, oh, well, one thing is, uh, so I actually haven't clicked on this discussions tab myself often. So I, I actually don't even know what's here. Oh, looks like people are asking questions. Okay, I should click on it. But yeah, I, if you can, Doug, like maybe convert this also to an issue, maybe we can okay. do a fix. Because I know issues definitely get a lot of uh, attention from the team. Okay, yeah, this was my first week actually engaging. I've been lurking uh, for months, and so I put one thing on Discord and another thing here, but I thought coming to this call would <laughs> would yeah. be a good way to learn how to actually engage correctly. No, that's good. Discord, GitHub are the main main channels. Okay. Um, all right, cool. Oh, sorry. Uh, one thing 
before I go to the questions is, yeah, this is the course that I mentioned earlier, Deep Learning AI. So yeah, enroll free. Uh, or I guess it's free for a limited time. So I guess do this earlier than later. Um, but yeah, check it out. Give us feedback. All right, now for our regularly scheduled programming. So some questions that have come in. So forgive me for botching the name, but Sultanbeck. Uh, Sultanbeck asks, uh, I'm really interested in creating dynamic, knowledgeable backend platform. I would like to see how we can generate files and use semantic kernel with existing and new files to burgeoning. OK, I'm trying to parse what the question is. Maybe if anyone here can, can help me. Um, OK, but it sounds like, OK, if, if oh, I just... I think I think I get it because I was literally just explaining. Oh, I'll take a stab at it is what I'm saying. If I, I didn't ahead. interrupt, so. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, I did knowledge graphs, like in property graphs specifically, like, you know, plus schema uh, before AI really took off, right? Like this, this was my thing. And what was always interesting was how do I like reduce friction in like accessing the graph? And I think what I think what I see this thing asking, right, is uh, how would I like interact with like a given knowledge base, which is what I think they're like saying, right? Um, like a, a property or RDF graph and be able to like store and retrieve information um, is what it sounds like they're talking about. Uh, I had only literally just had this idea for a friend who has like trouble. It like, doesn't have a good like process and flow down for remembering stuff. Um, but I would also be interested in uh, either creating a plugin, right, uh, that would allow GPT-4 or you know whatever application to 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 make it easier for folks to write to and read from like a local Neo4j instance or whatever. So, yeah, yeah, no, uh, yeah, I. To me, I, I read this as like I want to update or keep these knowledge bases, you know, updated with the the latest, and whatever the old way of of doing things is, like can semantic kernel, semantic AI, right, the, the way of, of of doing uh, this new way of programming, you know, can it help? And yeah, I mean, I think it you can create a skill or plugin, um, hooking up with your uh, backend platform of, of choice and maybe do some diff of, you know, existing versus potentially new things and update them accordingly. I guess more interestingly to me is like, okay, beyond just like the, the uh, like raw, like, okay, literally like this line of information change from, from, um, from the previous, it's like, how could you do this more semantically? and uh like relevant to an end user or at like the the scenario or situation that you're in um because i probably especially for companies undergoing digital transformation whatever that you know the the buzzword is like you want to uh yeah modernize right or at least improve your your knowledge graphs or you know information your data and yeah you could potentially use gpt4 to do that sort of translation um, by writing a skill slash plugin to to do so um i think it's i, I just probably described something very like hand wavy but the short I answer mean, it's literally that simple like you feed it an ontology i'm looking for the link right now if you feed it an ontology it can like define the appropriate schema right and start like loading the db so give me like two seconds and I'll find the link, but um, it's very possible and, and and is about as simple as you say. So yeah, yeah, definitely share that out. A good question, um, Sultan Beck. Hopefully you got your name right. But yeah, if you want to chat more about this, um, uh, share it on on Discord or or GitHub. Okay. Well, we do have a question from Discord, and this is actually a, a common one in my mind, but it's a super important one because uh, there's not a one way to solve this. But Ashish uh, asks, we have one, th we have thousands of APIs for our product. We have open API specification for all these APIs. 
when we're planning to create a copilot plugin using semantic kernel. Currently, we're using sequential planner to execute the user's goal from the API JSON, but the planner is not able to select the appropriate steps based on the user's prompt. What is the best practice to achieve this? So in short, right, this scenario where you have many, many plugins and you're trying to have the AI orchestrate between them, while planner is uh, marketed you know, or built to, to do this, you know, it starts to get more flaky uh, when you have a lot of uh, plugins to, to negotiate between. Because think about it when, right, at least in the, the naive implementation of this sort of stuff is you have to bake in all these uh, schemas into your prompt, uh, or at least the, the descriptions of them. And you have to, yeah, the AI has to intelligently choose among many, like which ones to, to use. And, you know, my response to this would be, you can maybe play around with, you know, doing a retriever sort of step first, uh, so you can down select from your thousands of APIs to potentially just some smaller number that's more relevant uh, for the problem or for that for the user's goal, right? And then run sequential planner on those on that down selection. Um, but honestly, like this is a emerging problem that probably instead of just having one planner. Um, or you can even call it one agent to try to solve this based off again, that's like the limitations of the current technology, right? There's a, only so many tokens you can use, uh, even for the, the largest of models. Um, maybe you have multiple agents, maybe you have multiple planners that can, uh, you know, try to, you know, you each, each, they each try to solve this problem. They may each have their own different set of skills because right, non-deterministic uh, running. And, you know, maybe there's some like reduced step to consolidate all that and and create a um, more robust plan out of that. But yeah, actually, Michael got the comment, but do you want to come off me to, to share about it? No audio. Oh, you fixed that. I'll read the comment. Okay. Oh, you got it. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I think I'm. I'm thinking back. Uh, sorry about that. Now, I was just saying. Yeah, Tool LLM is is an interesting paper. Um, they created a synthetic um, instruction uh, data set, and they used uh, that to fine tune Llama, and they essentially took. I think it's like 12,000 different APIs um, aggregated from, I think, is it, is it Rapid API maybe? And, um, and they were able to um, see an increase in efficacy and being able to um, orchestrate um, uh, it's sort of like these multi-step plans um, that involved calling out to multiple APIs uh, to achieve, you know, the desired output. And so I definitely take a read. I think that's like, honestly, a, Verbatim playbook. I think that this person can can probably use uh, for their use case. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, one other model um, or you know attempt to solve this is that I'm that I'm aware of is Gorilla Gorilla LLM. Right, it's a model that's fine tuned yeah, totally for right for API um, calling. And actually, I guess <laughs> plug for myself is uh, I recently interviewed um, the the creator of the Gorilla LLM on my Humans of AI podcast. Uh, so you can see that discussion there. But but basically, actually, it's easier just to pull up the product, the project page. Gorilla at Berkeley. Yeah, so the idea is that, right, for especially for API calling, um, right, you could potentially make use of more fine-tuned models that are specifically geared for this purpose. Um, and Gorilla uh, is one of those. Um, so yeah, I would definitely check it out. You can, yeah, beyond what, what I mentioned earlier with like a 
doing some intelligent retrieving, maybe, yeah, using a more appropriate model uh, would be good. So. But yes, th there's a really good question. Uh, I see Anthony, actually, you have a comment. You want to come off me to share your thought? Yeah, I think I shared this in Discord. I can't remember. Um, but another option, the uh, chat code pilot repository is a good example of this. Um, there's a pre-processing step that extracts the user intent based on the chat history. Um, and then it makes a semantically relevant question for things like in embeddings and, and all, data retrieval, all that kind of stuff. Um, might not fit one to one here for this person's particular use case, but potentially pre processing that input and telling it, hey, create a sentence that would be useful for determining which specific tools to use might be might be helpful here. Um, more of just a random thought I had, but I know at least where I work, we've, we've had some success with that pre-processing stuff, um, especially when it comes to choosing tools or creating embeddings. Yeah, good call out. Yeah, the, it, I mean, it, it's a problem that the semantic kernel team that's run that's building chat code pilot it's you know they've run into it so yeah they've created a solution not it's not the solution but it's a solution you can reference it uh to try to solve this problem but david do you, you have your hand up too thank you i wanted to ask um so like i come from like a data engineering background most recently right um and it's easy to to be a hammer to nails right but this one in particular, like Alex, what I was telling you about kind of before we started the recording, the thing I love about semantic kernel with it's like, you know, uh, plan like a step, right? And uh, DSP with the same, right? Is that you're basically creating like a pseudo DAG, like a directed acyclic graph, right? Um, I, I guess my question, right, to the audience, because this is the people who would care, right? If I'm trying to like navigate like an index of however many APIs, Right. Why would I not do kind of like a feature store esque, like making sure that my my lookup is up to date, right? And then have a DAG that just takes parameters as an input, right? And then you kind of extract the parameters from like the semantics of like your input. Um, that that just feels more efficient is all. Uh, and, and I realize that maybe I'm being reductive, but Michael seems to be nodding. So, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, actually, there was a discussion in Discord that I took part of, and I think it started as um, a discussion around how you can essentially cache some of these generated plans. Uh, but then, yeah, I also like ideated over the idea of, you know, representing these plans or the generated plans as a DAG, uh, but more so for validation, right? And to like, I, I guess with our use case, um, we're, we're trying to like build this framework where we're imposing like several guardrails. Um, into, I guess, the, the types of plans and the type of actions that the LLM can take, um, as, you know, as acting as an agent. Um, but yeah, there's definitely, going back to David's point, that there's probably some like really interesting stuff that we can do um, representing these plans as DAGs. And I think like, I think validation is one, I think parallelization is the other. Um, you know, if we can parallelize, you know, multiple calls to the LLM, um, there's, there's probably, and then you know the other th the interesting thing, and I don't know, I don't know, if this is just a thought experiment, but uh, once we represent these plans as DAGs, can we then now perform like some type of like um, either depth first or breadth first search um, to to essentially be able to you know use a like semantic uh, search right to essentially extract like the part of the DAG that's relevant um, you know for the I guess proposed actions that need to take place. And I'm probably explaining that very poorly, but there's there no, no, you did like, and yes, and, and you can always make something weirder and harder. Right. And, and I don't mean that as a criticism in this point. I mean that like, um, I have a whole spiel about conformal prediction, right? Because I, I got converted recently to, to being a proponent of like using outputs to predict outputs. Right. And in this way, right. If you're trying to be sure that, you know, uh, your semantic, like, abstraction like having taken the input string and abstracted like what parameters you intend to pass to the DAG right because you're lazy like me and don't want to build more than one DAG right um you if you have known good like a golden data set right of what semantic representations like were extracted into 
like what APIs to call, then yeah, it would be really easy to not just like have the model extract what it thinks are the right parameters, but to have it validate whether or not those look like the same parameters that had previously been identified as good. And then once you have a, an acceptable degree of confidence in like the parameters that you're about to pass to the DAG, that you then do that. Because you could even call that stepwise instead of convoluted, right? Because you're, you're making sure that you've got the, um, I know it's not really, but like uh, you don't waste compute then because you don't want to like execute a whole DAG only to find out that uh, your busted parameters screwed up your output. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Right. Yeah, we, should, we, should definitely, we should definitely jam on this because I can see this being used by, by a lot of different folks. Yeah, I, it's just lazy data engineering, but I'm, I'm good at that, so. Awesome, good discussion. Hopefully, Ashish, that was helpful to you. Um, all right, uh, we have two more questions, but actually you know, we're doing good on time. So Andre from YouTube says, or asks, how hard do you think it will be to create an AI agent that could run a business? Uh, well, I guess the question is, what business are you trying to run? Um, you know, I think I've seen some meme-worthy content out there where people have, what, given uh, AI like $1,000 or something, says try to turn this to $100,000. Actually, it's it's not even meme-worthy because well, who the, the founder of Inflection, um, Mustafa, I forgot his last name. Anyway, the, the guy who, who was the co-founder of DeepMind, he actually proposed a new Turing test that effectively was was that. It's like, oh, how do you measure intelligence instead of just asking, like, are you a, are you a robot or not? Um, trying to fool a human to, you know, with those answers. It's utility. It's he had like, a whole thing on the Ezra Klein podcast, right? It was great. So. Yeah, yeah. It's like, just give the AI a challenge to make money. <laughs> and if it's able to do so, well, maybe it's truly intelligent. Uh, and to, okay, so let's just go back to this question. How hard is it to create an AI agent like run a business? Okay, if we're talking about semantic kernel, if you're trying to do this, then yeah, you can, you know, hook it up to the relevant uh, data stores or connectors or plugins, um, and then you could build skills on top of it. Uh, maybe you want to, you know, I don't know if you're trying to do something e-commerce, right? Then yeah, like you can have, you can do it really like so many different use cases, right? With um, and build it with the semantic kernel, uh, and an AI agent can do anything from helping with your customer service to even like more blue sky, like finding items on Amazon or whatever or Alibaba or, and saying like, okay, can I make a, a margin, right? Can I do the, what, what's that term? Drop shipping or whatever to, to uh, make some profit. So anyway, all that's to say is that there's all this blue sky opportunity. Yes, I think you can use AI agents to create a business. Um, it just really depends which one. I guess curious for all of the people on the call who maybe are creating businesses with AI agents, I guess, what are you finding? How, what's been your experience? Uh, I'm trying to type and do something and I'm bad at that, but like uh, the biggest issue in my experience, not like in executing against like a, uh, like, you know, a release train's objectives or whatever, right, is defining all the tasks and making sure that you haven't, like, missed something, um, which often trips you up. I'm trying to find the specific, like, repo that basically was an LLM for task planning, right, like, specifically for defining, like, the, the work and the job of a software architect, of uh, a software engineer, of a scrum master, et cetera. I'm sure some of you guys are aware of what I'm talking about because it probably scared you too, right? We can find that repo. That's what the person is asking. Um, and to your point, Alex, even the uh, uh, like the, the DeepMind guy, right? Uh, at the risk of like presupposing that that his premise is maybe flawed, like transformers are not good at time series prediction. But that was the biggest issue with like having an AI make the money is that it's still an auto regressive model, right? That Jan Lahoon hates, right? And is still really bad at what it does. But it's if it can call another model that can do time series forecasting, it can make you the money, right? So even these like simple things that can do the task planning, uh, 
to have another like agent execute this something is what semantic kernel is for, right? Like this is built to like either build into your legacy apps or to make a plugin that makes it easy to like call so that once you've got your defined tasks, that's really the thing that like these auto regressive models are bad at is task planning and like reasoning, right? If you can get that defined because you're using a knowledge base or whatever, then it's really just a question of execution um, and, and IAM permissions and how, how bold you feel about your IAM policies. So you know, I'm gonna go try to find yeah. that just because like, so you know what I'm talking about, right? Like I'm not I'm not imagining mm -hmm. things exist. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. Right. Sure. I'm gonna try to Google it. So or ping it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Lucas, I saw your hand temporarily up. I don't know if you, you wanted to come off me to say something. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, and um, yeah, I just want to contribute to this uh, topic in terms of what I see in my surroundings here. I'm located in Berlin. So also many people are trying to build new business models on top of AI. And uh, so far, what happens is that many, especially smaller businesses, try to use AI to reduce, let's say, to achieve things that wouldn't be possible with, let's say, conventional ways uh, coming. I think it was already mentioned, speeding up customer support. I know some t uh, company, they, are, they built an agent to automate parts of their sales. So they crawl basically uh, websites and automatically look for leads, even send emails. So I think it's happening on this, uh, on this level of automation, but this, let's say, next level <laughs> idea that you really just plug in in the morning uh, your uh, yeah, agent, you started and uh, at the end of the day, you made some money and you just went out for a coffee all day. I think, uh, well, I haven't heard about this yet. Uh, nevertheless, if something happens or someone found a solution, I'm not sure if we would even know about it that fast. So <laughs> it's kind of like you found the best trading algorithm. So uh, in, in high frequency trading, for example, so it, it, it will be probably also kept secret for a while <laughs> because if a solution gets published where someone figures out how to make money, uh, I think many people will jump on this bandwagon and suddenly it's overcrowded and not anymore a way to make money, uh, like, usually, like common market forces. But uh, anyway, it's a super interesting topic and good question from the community. Yes, for sure. And that's why you want to be very wary of the influencers who say, make X money with AI, right? If they found that secret sauce, they should not be sharing that uh, uh, publicly. Yeah, they'd be working for a hedge fund as a quant, like he was talking about, so, or That's right. doing That's right. it themselves. That's right. Okay, we have uh, five minutes left. So last question from Peter, Discord. Uh, Hi guys, I need some help with differentiating connectors from skills, plugins, and memories. The GitHub syntax examples, I noticed that connectors and plugins can be used interchangeably, basically. Is there a set standard and definition? documentation doesn't provide sufficient explanation for the concrete differences using C sharp for some context. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree, you know, this is a like naming thing that can sometimes be very confusing. Before I try to answer this, how, if you know, I open up to you all, how have you rationalized the difference between a connector and a plugin? Well, I'll start. <laughs> so connectors in my mind, uh, you know, it's it's giving you're effectively hooking into some API, a data store, um, some something that's external to the large language model, first of all, right? So that's why you're connecting it to the LLM. Plugins, at least, even at least the way we've been defining it, right? Like strictly speaking. Um, it's around a common schema, right? This like open API type schema where you can define the the you know the the inputs, the description, and all that. And you can create native plugins or semantic plugins, at least for semantic kernel. And yes, you can also hook up to APIs with that, and that's where this probably is confusing. 
Um, but I think the idea is that the way I rationalize it, if like a vector hooking up to some vector database itself um, is a you're at, you're adding some what do you want to call it like a feature to the kernel, but when you want to add a plugin, you're actually you're adding mm, value, right? You're, the the plugin is is about like getting value out of whatever the the end like API. Uh, that's hosting it uh, is it's like saying this is the contract, this is the input and output uh, type, and if you use it, this is what you're you're getting back. And connectors are probably lower level in the abstraction, where it's more yeah. If you want to build a plugin, then yeah, you probably want to maybe use a connector. So that's the you know off the top of my head <laughs> how I would respond. Uh, Lucas, go ahead. Uh, yeah, this is also a really good question that um, uh, I, uh, I recently talked about uh, also with our team, how to separate it mentally. And we came up with the idea that uh, the best way is to think like on, on, on the CPU, you have like this control flow and you have the data flow. And connectors are uh, helping you to uh, manage the data flow of your uh, semantic kernel application, while plugins allow you to e extend the control flow. So you can, yeah, let's say with the control flow, uh, adjust the way how your workflow or how your application behaves, while connectors just help you on, on the data uh, side. But I'm not sure we are just, uh, looking from the outside to it, and th but that's how we interpret it so far. No, that's good. I, I like the uh, analogy, and yeah, from from the semantic kernel team, you know, for me, when I see this, I'll for sure relay that back to the team to hopefully make that distinction a a bit clearer in the documentation. But yes, Peter, good question. Thank you for asking it. All right. Well, we are at time, so everyone, thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you for joining this new time. Hopefully it's better for especially our European uh, community. Um, we also, you know, I'm in discussion with actually some teams for the ANZ APAC region uh, to stand up an, another office hours just for, for that group. So yes, for people listening who can't attend live, uh, and are part of that region, you know, stay tuned for, for that. Um, but cool. Again, thank you, everybody. So see you all on Discord or GitHub. Take care.